Peruvian Congress approved advancing the general elections to April 2024. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky arrived in the U.S. to pay an official visit to his counterpart Joe Biden and to attend a Congress session pondering military aid to his country. A military coup attempt and arrested four soldiers plotting to overthrow President Adama Boros' administration. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Dresu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. On Tuesday, with 93 votes in favor, 30 votes against, and one abstention, the Peruvian Congress approved advancing the general elections to April 2024. The legislative body justified these decisions with the need for the terminations of the mandates of the executive and legislative branches to coincide at the end of July 2024. However, the bill must still be ratified by the next ordinary legislature, which begins on March 1, 2023. By making such a decision, the Peruvian lawmakers left aside the proposal of President Dina Boluarte, who stated that general elections should be held in December 2023, a possibility that the electoral authorities ratified as technically feasible. During the debate, leftist legislators demanded the call for a constituent assembly, but it was rejected by the conservative caucuses, arguing that they want to provide tranquility to the country. Social and human rights organizations in Argentina protest on Wednesday to demand the release of the leader of the Tupac Amaru Neighborhood Association, Milagro Sala. The demonstration will begin at 4 p.m. local time in the city of Buenos Aires with a gathering at the intersection of May Avenue and July 9th Avenue and plans to continue with the march towards Plaza de Mayo. Protesters stated they will remain at the plaza until Friday to demand the national government grant the pardon to Milagro Sala before the end of the holidays. The call came after the Supreme Court of Justice ratified the 13-year prison sentence against the leader of the Tupac Amaru movement for the crimes of illicit association, extortion, and defrauding the state. Brazil's Chamber of Deputies held a second vote on Wednesday on a proposed constitutional amendment aimed at maintaining social welfare assistance to those living in poverty through the Bolsa Familia program. The initiative, promoted by President-elect Luis Ignacio Lula Silva, was endorsed in the first vote on Tuesday with the support of 331 legislators, while 168 voted against, among the parliamentarians who support outgoing President Jair Bolsonaro. With the proposal, Lula Silva seeks to fulfill his main campaign promises, which include an additional quota of 150 reals, equivalent to $29 for each child up to six years of age. The Victims' Unit of Colombia revealed that a total of 253 indigenous Embera settled in Bogota will begin their voluntary return to Choco and the Department of Cauca on Wednesday. The families who were settled in La Florida Park and in La Rioja will be accompanied to their reserves by officials of the Attorney General's office and other state institutions. The entity indicated that the Emberas who will leave their settlements will receive support for their sustainability as well as humanitarian aid to avoid a new displacement. They also informed that they will deliver habitability kits with materials that would allow the members of these communities to build temporary shelters. In Colombia, a strong fire is reported in the industrial zone of northeast Barranquilla that has already claimed the life of at least one firefighter. The event took place in the company of Associated Ports in the north of the city, where hydrocarbons are stored and transported, which allow the flames to spread rapidly in the area. The Barranquilla Fire Department is deployed in the area to attend the emergency where two members have been injured, and it was reported that one of them, Sergeant Javier Enrique Solano Ruiz, died. The emergency agency asked citizens to stay away from the place and delivers to and drivers to look for alternative roads. Thousands of migrants were exposed to 
in the border zone after restrictions were tightened to prevent them from seeking asylum in the United States. According to U.S. officials, the Supreme Court will not lift the immigration restrictions before Christmas, a day after Chief Justice John Roberts issued a temporary order to keep the limitations in place at the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Officials have turned away most migrants who apply for border relief, arguing to prevent the spread of COVID-19 under a public health rule called Title 42. Let's take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on TikTok at the account at Telesor English in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates and much more. All the stories coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back from the South. In Bolivia, the national government delivered a an equipment for municipal hospitals for a value of close to $10 million as part of a state program to reactivate the health sector in order to provide free care to the population. From La Paz, our correspondent Freddy Morales with the details. The value of this health equipment is approximately $10 million. They are distributed to all the country's municipalities as part of a state program to provide free care for the population throughout the single health service. Since its creation, 132 million free services have been provided to the Bolivian people from medical attention, laboratories, consultations with specialists and medicine, to minor and major surgeries. We're talking about very high-cost surgeries and oncological procedures such as radiotherapies and chemotherapies, dialysis and even renal transplants. Municipalities responsible for the first level of health care participate in the definition and execution of state health policies. Mayors are preparing a campaign to improve vaccination levels in our municipalities, especially in children and adolescents. We are coordinating this with the health minister. We will also have a plan to improve the regulations in the municipal governments so that we can all improve our vaccination level. The equipment consists of seven items, including X-ray machine, ultrasound scanners, electrocardiographs, secretion aspirators, pulse oximeters, high flow generators, and 12 drug cards. We have been visiting many municipalities and there is a strong request for the health issue. Since we took over the national government, we have decided that the best social policy we could undertake in the country is health for the Bolivian people. And a greater commitment to free health care is also demanded, the responsibility that, according to the country's law, is shared among municipalities at the first level and governor's offices at the second and third levels. We have to guarantee not only the equipment but also the material required by our medical health personnel to be able to attend to the population, and this requires a budget. It requires that the mayors and our governments spend a large part of these resources on health care. In the year of the de facto government between 2019 and 2020, which coincided with the beginning of the COVID pandemic, state health programs declined to the point that new hospitals built by the government of Evo Morales were not put into operation and negotiations were executed in the purchase of equipment such as ventilators, which were urgently needed at the time. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is in the United States for a 10-hour visit as Congress discusses an World War aid package for Ukraine. White House spokeswoman Karine Jean-Pierre said Zelensky will meet with President Biden and key members of the national security team to discuss the capabilities and training that the West will continue to provide to Kiev, along with future economic, energy and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. The Ukrainian lead is also expected to participate in a congressional session where he will deliver a speech to coincide with the debate on increased aid to Kiev to approve another 45 billion US dollars for the war. The United States House Ways and Means Committee has voted along party lines to publicly release a report on years of Donald Trump's tax returns, which is the former president has long tried to shield. 
Now the lawmakers have voted 24 to 16 to move forward with plans to release the returns. It's unclear how quickly that could happen, but after a years-long battle that ultimately resulted in the Supreme Court clearing the way last month for the Treasury Department to send the returns to Congress, Democrats have been under pressure to act aggressively. The committee received six years of tax returns for Trump and some of his businesses, and with just two weeks left until Republicans formally take control of the House, Wednesday's meeting could be the last opportunity for Democrats to disclose whatever information they have discovered. In the United States, also medical facilities and healthcare professionals in New York City have been overwhelmed by what some are referring to as a triple pandemic. As a surge in flu, respiratory, syncytial virus, and COVID-19 cases see hospitals fill up with sick patients. Healthcare workers are being pushed to the limit as emergency rooms are being stretched and nurses are being called in to help in the lead up to Christmas. Rates of RSV, which can cause breathing trouble for young children, have nearly doubled since October, with the city witnessing large crowds due to the festive season. Authorities are not taking any chances. Earlier this month, the city issued a health advisory recommending mask wearing at crowded public areas, indoors, and when riding on transport systems, so as to slow the transmission of the viruses. I work at two major hospitals in New York City, and our census is definitely up. Uh, in the ERs, you have hallway patients, which there aren't enough rooms to house the patients coming in. So we open up corridors in the hallways, we open up hallway beds in the ER itself, and I'm seeing a lot of rapid response assignments coming out for nurses, which tells me that it is all over New York. In the UK, ambulance workers have gone on strike with widening a dispute with the government over its refusal to increase pay above inflation after recent walkouts by nurses. A series of stoppages are causing misery in Britain in the run-up to Christmas, with railway workers and passport control officers also threatening to ruin festive holiday ga gateways as the government refuses to cede on pay demands. On Wednesday, ambulance staff at the state-run National Health Service, including paramedics and call handlers, walked out, prompting warnings from healthcare leaders about straining a health system already in crisis. Unions representing both NHS nurses and ambulance workers have threatened with further stoppages in the new year should the government keep refusing to discuss pay. Still, trade unions have made absolutely clear they will respond to emergency calls. Unite Union representative Steve Thompson said the walkout is about pay, but also about trying to retain and improve the quality of services. The International Energy Agency said on Wednesday that the European Union faces a potential shortfall of almost 40 billion cubic meters of natural gas in 2023. To counteract, to, to counteract this reality, the EU is promoting joint gas procurement under the energy platform and is on track to meet its goal of reducing gas demand by 15%. Vice President of the European Commission, Maro Sefcovic, made the statements after a high-level roundtable on EU joint procurement of natural gas. As the largest natural gas importer in Germany, Uniper sells natural gas to hundreds of energy suppliers and companies. It has been suffering huge losses due to the impact of the conflict in Ukraine and the bloc's sanctions imposed on Russia. Meanwhile, in France, facing fears of possible large-scale and continuous power cuts this winter, people and businesses are stocking up on camping stoves and generators. We have more news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Germany will be returning 20 historic bronze sculptures to Nigeria as part of efforts to address its dark colonial past. German's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock made the announcement on Tuesday. Nigeria's Foreign Affairs Minister Geoffrey Oneyama expressed deep gratitude to Germany as he urged England and other countries in possession of other artifacts to return them on moral grounds. The prized cultural artifacts, known as Benin bronzes, were looted from Nigeria while under colonial rule. The sculptures will be handed over to Nigerian officials in a ceremony at the capital Abuja. Cast in brass, 
and bronze with ancient designs, the sculptures were used in rituals to honor Benin people's ancestors and rulers. In recent years, Nigerian authorities have intensified efforts to get rooted artifacts returned. Germany has pledged to repatriate more than a thousand cultural artifacts in the coming years. I think as Germans and Europeans, we should really pause for a moment and reflect on what this actually means. What it means not to have crucial part of your history with you, but to have it taken from you. What would it mean to us to be deprived of our cultural heritage? Not to be able to marvel the Gutenberg Bible in Mainz, to be unable to admire Martin Luther's writings, to stand in front of a sculpture by Kete Kollwitz in Berlin, or at Goethe's death in Weimar. To you here in Nigeria, however, this loss has been your reality for your whole life. Today, we are here to return the Benin Bronxes to where they belong, to the people of Nigeria. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad issued on Wednesday Legislative Decree No. 24 of 2022 granting a general amnesty for crimes committed before December 21st of this year. The decree will take effect as from December 24th of this year and grants a general amnesty to those accused of smuggling, treason, espionage and terrorist acts. Likewise, the amnesty states Syrians who escaped the mandatory military service and are inside the country will have three months to turn themselves in, while those abroad will get four months. However, the decree does not cover fines for breaking the law and regulations of the foreign exchange market, remittances, traffic and tobacco fines. Gambian authorities have followed a military coup attempt and arrested four soldiers plotting to overthrow President Adama Barrow's administration, according to a governmental statement released on Wednesday. The Gambian Armed Forces High Command arrested four soldiers linked to the alleged coup after a military operation on Tuesday. Coup attempts are not uncommon in Gambia, a tiny West African country with a population of 2.5 million and almost entirely surrounded by Senegal which is still reeling from over two decades on the former president Yahya Jameh, marked by authoritarian and authoritarianism and alleged abuses. The army is in pursuit of three other alleged accomplices and investigations are ongoing. South Africa President Cyril Ramaphosa vowed to unite the ANC and tackle Graf after the ruling party who elected him for a second term despite a recent scandal. And in a five-day conference, around 4,000 delegates showed Ramaphosa after a bruising battle against his former health minister, Sueli Mixé. The ANC's majority in the National Assembly is under threat given the last local government elections where they won less than 50% of the votes, a first in a history spanning more than a century. Ramaphosa's victory opens the way for him to win a second term in power if the ANC wins the next general election in 2024. We have recognized that corruption within the ANC is indeed a dire threat to the continued existence of our organization and to the future of the National Democratic Revolution. We have recognized the great progress that has been made over the last five years in tackling corruption within our ranks, within the state, and across society. But we have also acknowledged that we have not done enough to end corruption, to reverse the effects of state capture, and to deal with the corrosive effects of the ANC and institutions across society. The former president of Russia and current vice president of the country's Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, was received by the president of China, Xi Jinping, in Beijing. The former president said that during the meeting with the leader of the Asian country, they discussed the interaction between Moscow and Beijing, as well as economic issues and industrial cooperation. In addition, Medvedev's team informed that the Russian politician has conveyed a message from President Vladimir Putin to his Chinese counterpart. After the meeting, the Russian senior officials stressed the importance of the strategic partnership between Moscow and Beijing.
Negotiations were held today with the General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, Chairman of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. We discussed issues of interaction between the two ruling parties, between the Communist Party of China and United Russia, as well as issues of bilateral cooperation or strategic partnership with China in all areas, including, of course, the economy, industrial cooperation, and much more. We discussed international issues, including, of course, the conflict in Ukraine. These thoughts were very useful. And we have come to the end of this news program. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tresolenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesol English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.